Okay, um, I'm going to summarize what took me quite a while to write and what is certainly not suitable for reading or presenting in its entirety. So focus on a couple of key issues of how the Ukrainian language is assessed, categorized by um, producers or writers of ethnographic, historiographic discourses and what it tells us about their precarious position and their aims in participating and producing these discourses of Ukraine. So I'll provide a couple of more generic general comments and focus on a couple of more specific issues such as Pavlovsky's grammar, or the first grammar of Ukrainian language. So anyone who looks at how Ukrainian language is described, uh, let's say from the late 18th century onwards, would be struck by the number of contradictions. That there are so many irreconcilable aspects of it or descriptions of it that one can be just puzzled. The first contradiction or puzzlement comes with the very definition. Is it a dialect or a language? You'll encounter both in the same, sometimes in the same sentence. Sort of trying to figure out, operate, adjust. Is it different or how different is it from Russian? Is it very close? Is it the same? Or is it the most distant dialect of the Russian language? You find that too. Is it dead or alive? Is it pure, pure Slavic language of Nestor? Or is it contaminated? Again, these are, this is, these are actually axes of um, polar uh, definitions that coexist in cultural discourse in the Russian Empire. Ukrainian producers of that discourse from the late 18th century onwards. And we find them, as I mentioned, within the same text, we find these contradictions connected. And what it means, they are not linguistics. When we deal with Ukrainian language at that time, they are not talking about linguists who in abstract terms are discussing. They are not reading Gumboldt in or Schlegel or even Herder. Not all of them read Herder and were linguists. Ling linguistics is still in an essence state in Russian Empire. There are very few li purely linguistic works. So the speculations or definitions of Ukrainian language have to do with Ukraine rather than linguistics. Have to do with the legacy, polity, and in fact politics and strategies of Ukrainian elites within the Russian Empire. How to position themselves, their past, and how to adjust in this new political environment of integrated or being integrated into the new system after the Catherine the Great. And uh, many of those descendants of Cossack elites play very active, they engage in the formation of the Russian Empire, they play active part in exploring geographic explorations, in translations of Western European works into Russian or that is literary language of the Russian Empire. They are very active, and one part of their activism is packaging of what is Ukraine for them in terms that would privilege their position within that empire. This is what um, Zenon Kohut calls the paradigm of um, Russo-Ukrainian uh, unity and Ukrainian distinctiveness. That is, they are trying to say, we are the same. We are Qualified, we are eligible to, to play the same role as your administrators, we are the same as Russian gentry, so they are absorbed into Russian hereditary gentry, but they also have to assert their difference. Their, but not just difference, difference as a positive distinction. That is, we are different with a plus sign rather than negative sign, because ne negative sign difference would mean mazepanism, would mean political uh, dissent, unreliability, and treason. I'm leading toward the notion that this balancing act of oneness with Russia and difference from Russia is something that all Ukrainian participants, that is, uh, noblemen, intelligentsia, customarily do within the Russian Empire throughout the 19th century. This is nothing for us to be surprised about. And therefore, these contradictions are, again, nothing to be surprised about. It's to be expected. And it, it structures the way they talk about language, about Ukraine, and it structures the way the rhetorics of Ivan Valuev's decree works. When these Ukrainians themselves deny the possibility of Ukrainian language, it's the evocation of alternative collective community to propose that measure against Ukrainian language. Again, very logical. Um, 
Uh, in my uh, work, I looked at a couple of examples where you find definitions of Ukrainian language toward the, uh, at the end of 18th century. And for me, it's a key period because this is the period when Ukrainian elites realized their defeat. The autonomy is gone. Late 18th century, everything is incorporated into the administrative grid of the Russian Empire. So now they're trying to reconfigure, figure, figure out what they're going to do now in this set of circumstances when they have to go to Petersburg mostly if they want to promote themselves and get a career rather than going to Hluhiv, for example. So that's, that's quite important. And this is the period when at the Zborotko Center uh, or Circle in Petersburg we have projects that cover various aspects of what Ukraine is. We have ethnographic piece, uh, Yakiv Markovich, the piece here Malarasi notes about Little Russia that initially was planned as a multi-volume Ukrainica cycle. We have um, Mikhail Antonovsky sneaking in Ukraine into his translation, expanded and changed translation of Johann Georgi, German scholar, ethnographic description of the Russian Empire and all its inhabitants. They sneak in, they change, they position Ukraine within, the, within these projects. So in Markovich, for example, we find the following description of Ukrainian. In ancient times, I quote, the inhabitants of Little Russia spoke Slavonic, but they lost or corrupted it in the times when they were the captives of the Tatars, Lithuanians, and Poles. Nonetheless, in the current Ukrainian language, or properly speaking dialect, he keeps adjusting, one still observes certain nuances reflecting both the beneficial climate and tender soul of its speakers. If one throws out all the crude words used by simple folk, excludes borrowing from the Germans, from the German, French, and Crimean Tatars, Tatar language, and then forms a judgment about it, about its spirit, one would have to admit the Little Russian language is tender, pleasant, and full of emotional expressions and diminutives that originated, of course, from nothing else than the sensitivity of its inventors. One could call, call it the language of love, or at least very apt to vividly express the feelings of love. So we have this packaging of Ukrainian language. Ukraine is packaged in uh, Markovich as our Switzerland, the privileged, more beautiful, beneficial part of the empire. And of course, the myth of Ukraine as Italy, as Greece, is also forms part of these, uh, what I would call packaging, to present it as a positive, as desirable element of the Russian Empire that privileges those who are, who, who are from it or represent it. Um, similarly, Mikhailo Antonovsky talks about Cossack dialect, but then he, he goes on into describing free dialectal varieties of that dialect. Uh, again, I'm not a linguist. Can a dialect have dialectal varieties that are different? Again, language, dialect, um, they are not talking linguistics, they are talking cultural politics. What is especially interesting in Antonovsky that I want to highlight is um, the following a pronouncement about Ukrainians integrated in the Russian Empire and their correct, soft, pleasant, and refined pronunciation of the Russian language, literary language. Um, what, what this sentence like this means, in fact, it addresses the notion of Ukrainian accent. Ukrainians in Petersburg having an accent and becoming recognizable as Ukrainians and addressed either as Chochol or not. But this, again, nuances like this indicate the uh, tricky, sometimes even treacherous positioning of a Ukrainian within the imperial capital. And the documents that survive, uh, epistolary and otherwise, again, I don't have time to go into details, are abound. So projects like Antonovsky or Markovich, they try to use the, they try to cope with the integration of Ukraine into the Russian Empire and position their legacy that includes language in a, in a beneficial, privileged uh, in a position. Contrary to that, another project that originated at the same time, Kotlerevsky's Eneida does the opposite thing. It declares directly declares the divergence and self-sufficiency uh, of Ukrainian language uh, and presents in the poem a verbal metaphor, I quote, for the entire Ukrainian nation, an ethos. In addition to presenting the narrative of Perelitsyovany, uh, uh, Aeneas, who changed clothing, 
um, he appends a significant um, glossary of nearly a thousand words to his Eneida. Not he, it's, Par um, it's Parpura, the editor who was in Petersburg and was also connected to the circle of Bezborochko. Um, while Kotlerevsky established the legitimacy of Ukrainian language in Russian literary scene, this is late classicism, as a language of laughter, or in some cases that would be language of crude jokes, the enterprise itself is far from jocular and funny. And uh, here I would quote uh, from Opanas Lobesevich, um, Kotlerevsky's predecessor, who also was an author of travestied vernacular um, bucolics of Virgil, and who um, uh, addressed at one point Archbishop Grigory Konitsky, asking him to send him um, Ukrainian vernacular intermedia. And this is what he said about these works. Just as, ev just as with every style of clothing, every dialect has its beauty. For whom even smoke from the motherland is pleasing, the fragrance of native thoughts is most sweet. For the sake of the honor of our nation, he uses Nazia, our mother, who has always had men born great or made great through learning, and who has produced so many luminaries for our beloved fatherland, Atechistva, and here he means Ukraine still, I ask your grace to do me this great favor and send them these texts to Petersburg. Let our Plautus, our Moliere, contribute to the grandeur of, the, of our fatherland. So, even though the enterprise itself could be funny, and it became the staple, the, the uh, perception of Ukrainian as funny language, a language of anecdotes and jokes, the enterprise itself suggests that language is a legacy that preserves not just gems of thought, but ways of thinking, the habitus of the Ukrainian polity, nation, its memory and dignity. Um, now, so how understandable was Ukrainian in the Russian Empire at the time? Again, we have all sorts of opinions. We have, for example, Naslednik, the uh, Grand Duke uh, Nikolai Pavlovich, future Nicholas I, coming to visit Ukraine, Sloboda, Ukraine, and receiving a copy of Eneida from the author who had a short audience here with his, with his future majesty. Did he really read anything like that? Or we have Polyvoy's Russian critic statement that in its own time, that is early 19th century, we Russians, he says, actually enjoyed reading Kotlerevsky's Eneida. Could Russians, again, Russians who lived in Ukraine, that is merchant class, for example, uh, the new class of emerging readers within the empire, probably could have. But meanwhile, we have, uh, we have Kostomarov's statement, Kostomarov, before he became fluent in Ukrainian, how frustrated it was for him, frustrating it was for him, uh, reading uh, Soldatsky Patret by Osnovyanenko, not being able to follow it in Ukrainian. Uh, and that only stimulated his eagerness at learning the language, which he, in the end, he mastered and practiced it as a writer. So, uh, what does it mean to understand a language? To understand an Aida means sort of poke at a couple of cantos and just laugh because sucha dochka and there are those funny words and they're all funny and everything is funny, but I don't think the, the glossary of 972 words appended would help any Russian reader to actually grasp what's going on there. And that could, uh, could be seconded by an interesting opinion by a traveler, Ivan Dolgorukov, who around 1805 uh, visited Kiev and went through Ukraine. And this is what he felt. I stopped understanding the language of the people. <coughs> a simple person spoke to me answering my questions, but I didn't understand me, uh, but didn't understand me completely. And I needed translation for three words out of his five. So once he crosses the boundary to a little Russia, he realizes this is not my territory, this is not my culture. And he went as far as even declaring, um, we know that elites speak the common language, but um, I could agree that something like Liefland or Kurland do not really belong to the Russian Empire. 
and I know it's politically incorrect, but this is my opinion. Now, he's talking about Kurland, of course, but Ukraine is trickier, much trickier, because Ukraine, Little Russia, is not a Kurland. It's a cradle of the Russian Empire, of its history and of its religion. And therefore, to part with that or realize that this culture is not fully com comprehensible, that it has to be translated, is much more traumatic for a Russian uh, speaker or car vessel carrier of the Russian culture to admit. He doesn't go as far as saying that Ukraine does not belong to the Russian Empire. But Kurlian suggests in this direction, or that his definitions would suggest this kind of uh, direction. Um, now, the first grammar of Ukrainian, Pavlovsky's uh, 1818 Grammatica Malorossiskova Narechi of Ukrainian of, of Little Russian dialect, produced at the turn of the century, much earlier, 15 years earlier. Uh, he submitted it to the Academy in 1805, but it was not approved for publication or sponsorship. Therefore, he had to publish it. It took him 15 years to publish it privately in Petersburg. The so-called Hudam Luvnitsa, as Shafarik put it, put it, sort of Huda means both slight and sliding. It is short, and it focuses only on differences between Little Russian dialect, as he puts it, and the mainstream Russian literary language. And uh, despite the fact that the position of Pavlovsky's grammar shifted over, over time, we have Kostomarov ignoring it in his survey of uh, literature written in Ukrainian vernacular, produced at the height of Ukrainian romantic thought in 1840s. Uh, we have Bodyansky deny its values, but it's a very interesting document that internalizes some of the most important tensions, what Ukrainians, again, I, I don't have time to go into much details, but some I will address. One of the most striking uh, elements of this grammar, a part of the mysterious author uh, Shevelyov asserted he is Ukrainian from Novgorod Siversky circle. In its text, he treats himself, he describes himself as an outsider who lived among Ukrainians and decided to present this grammar. So it's quite a, he, his position there that he himself creates is quite peculiar or precarious. Pre precarious. And he constantly blurs the, the differences and definitions between dialect and language. A dialect that almost, as he says, constitute a, a true language. A language, so to say, this is a quotation from Pavlovsky, neither dead nor alive, suspended in a limbo. Uh, but what is very interesting, what I want to draw our attention to, before Frank tells me to <laughs> finish, um, is the internalized questions, questioning, that are in the text of this grammar. The questioning of the imagined or implicitly felt imperial eye. Um, the suspicious and investigative cultural authority that manifests itself in Pavlovsky. Questions such as, um, if one can be occupied by various languages and dialects studying them, why not Ukrainian, he asks. Or, is it necessary to propose rules of Ukrainian composition? He asks. What purpose could the grammar of the Little Russian dialect serve? Is it necessary to preserve various dialects? So this is very key. It's, it's, it's not just rhetorics. These are internalized questions in response to authority that he feels is hovering above him. Um, uh, he, in discussing Ukrainian language, he also invokes uh, or creates the notion of collective community. He doesn't want to directly say what he thinks, but he assesses the statements of Ukrainian patriots who had characterized the language as tender. This is an indirect connection to Markovich's uh, statement of Ukrainian as language of love. Now, he denies this sentence as valid because we can't talk about language as being tender or not, but we can maybe talk about nation <coughs> being tender. So he's digressing. He also points to those, he points to a group of little Russian elites who, who are cultivating uh, the language and promotes its virtues and status as a language. Uh, so what are his conclusions? I quote, let's first clean up the language of the little Russians, here he uses language, from all sounds contrary or foreign to its nature, 
let's give it a suitable form and then form an accurate verdict. While he begins with a characterization in terms of deformation of the dialect, dialect is a imperial language is always impure or contaminated. It's normal in any, co normal in any colo colonial uh, society uh, in that sense. But then he stresses one must be very skilled in the little Russian language in order to grasp the value of Ukrainian literary works, so difficult is the little Russian idiom. So, in other words, of what I want to stress here, and uh, one more point, I want to, to a couple more points on Pavlovsky. When uh, he stresses a couple of uh, important aspects of Ukrainian as particularly valuable, overriding what he says about it as neither dead nor alive, is speaking about historical values of Ukrainian. I quote, while reading the history of the Russian chronicler, that is Nestor, the most venerable chronicler, I felt in many places, wait, um, I felt in many places that one needs to know the language of the little Russians. That is, despite his cautious balancing, uh, he confirms that in the imperial hierarchy of languages and dialects, Ukrainian is a language of ancient roots and cultural potential with significant differences from Russian. Why is this dialect almost a language, as he says, neither dead nor alive, so important to him? Why did he want to record at least a single trace of the vanishing dialect? For the imperial audience, of course, it is a matter of curiosity and, as Pavlovsky painstakingly argued, of intellectual and linguistic benefit to the imperial culture. However, there is another message directed at the descendants of the Ukrainian Cossack elites. This message, the second uh, message, shapes a different definition, urges a different action, ex nostalgia, to record, codify, and promote the Ukrainian language to grasp and preserve its essence or character as a depository or indeed a portal to one's Ukrainian identity. Pavlovsky's universalist desideratum to preserve every dialect as a unique gift of God acquires a new meaning when directed to Ukrainians. I quote, Who will show us the true image of our ancestors in olden times if we don't preserve their real way of thinking and their dialect? In other words, through the careful sequence of definitions, queries, reservations, and propositions, Pavlovsky in his grammar attempts nothing less than the affirmation of Ukraine, Ukraine through language. And uh, I will, a uh, few more minutes, I will conclude with what happens in Romantic period. Folklore explodes. Uh, Maximovich's collection of Ukrainian songs, in addition to folkloric texts, appends literary texts as if providing a transition. He appends Vlaka Temovsky's translation of uh, Nitskevich's Pani Tvardovska as here is a bridge from folklore to normal or non kotlarevsky influenced uh, serious Ukrainian poetic diction. Ballads fashioned uh, with help of folklore and translations are key vehicles for Ukrainian literati to assert that Ukrainian language is autonomous, universal, because if you look at some translations, it's understandable. You look at translations of ballads or Lenore, it's clear why you want to do that in Ukrainian. It's most, most natural to transpose. But if you look at Fares, Mitskevich's Orientalist Kasida, why would Lev Borovakovsky translate that text into Ukrainian? And the answer is clear. He treats it as language able to talk about anything. It's a universal language. And this is what Kostomarov does when he translates from Hebrew melodies by Byron. So this is one way. The, um, the most important part is, while these members of intelligentsia realize the historical agency of Ukrainian elites is over, the Cossack Dome is over, this is what Shpehoetsky writes in his letter, Kazakhovania is gone, but now it's time for a Cossack to go on with the harmonious sounds of his Kopsa, that is with poetry, with culture, this is now the agency that we have to partake in and prove that we are what we are worth of. So, moreover, the language itself is often treated, if you look at the Romantic poetry, as it's not the political agency of hetmans, but language becomes the vessel of charismatic power. 
an instantly bonding, tacitly sensed, emotionally gripping, and divinely sanctioned endowment to the national community in a state of self-awareness and self-making. And the last point that emerges in the, in the, in the uh, Romantic period, the argument for Ukrainian language, is demographic. When Kostomarov writes that why 12 million of people should not be allowed to develop their language, their literature, and benefit from it. So we have a remarkable sort of explosion. And Romantic period, of course, is the best period for doing it. But we also have, of course, that saturation, that action of Ukrainian intelligentsia brings a response, a variety of responses in the imperial center. And this brings it to the point where that neither dead or alive language somehow becomes with Shevchenko help, Shevchenko's help, of course, as well, a little bit too alive to, uh, for them to be comfortable with. And Thank you. Thank you.